Okay, welcome to a revision video where we're going to go over the main points of the material that we covered uh, through different parts of the ecology unit. So the ecology unit is kind of broken up into some uh, different sections, pretty much very similar to how the uh, cells unit was. So um, if you're looking for a specific material, uh, you might need to check a different um, video. So just look for the title and see whether or not it's a uh, or the description and see if it covers this the, that material that you're expecting it to be on. So for this one we'll be going through the basics of ecosystems and ecology, uh, the key vocabulary terms, and uh, again getting into some species interactions and um, trophic levels, food levels, uh, food chains, and food webs, things like that. So we turn it off and you make sure you understand what ecology is. So again, ecology is this idea that we are studying the environment, but we need to be very specific when we talk about that. I can't just say studying the environment or studying an ecosystem. What we really mean is that we're studying all of the living and the non-living parts of an ecosystem. So we say living versus non-living, right? Or we could say biotic versus abiotic, right? So biotic being living or abiotic being non-living, the a referring to non. So that would be what an ecology means. And when we talk about an environment, when we think about studying environments, we're looking at everything that is around an organism that could be possibly influencing it. So you have an environment and people in a whole different other part of the world have their own environment. And so environment is very, is, uh, very, very specific compared to something of just like ecology. Ecology is uh, something that we'd apply to all of the different types of environments in different parts of the world. So for example, we're thinking about a tadpole. Tadpole has an environment of a pond and there are a lot of different factors uh, in that pond. We have the plants that are available, the animals that are around, uh, whether or not there's detrius, which is this dead organic uh, material that would be floating around in the water and that's most likely what the uh, tadpole is gonna be eating. Uh, or so it's food sources, uh, how available oxygen is. So when we think about uh, an environment, just think about what are the specific features of uh, what's surrounding you right now? So that would be your environment. So then as we start to look at more specific words, there are some key terms you need to make sure that you understand. So when you talk about the word habitat, that habitat is that physical location that you actually live in. So uh, you might have diverse habitats. You might have habitats where you live uh, part of the day at school, you have part of the day you're living at home, you might live in a, another part of the world for parts of the year, right? So you might have uh, different uh, habitats in different locations. There are species that will have a habitat in one specific place. So maybe they live uh, only on one particular type of plant. And so they don't live anywhere else in the world except for a specific species of plant and wherever that plant occurs. Uh, or it could be, um, you know, like a very diverse habitat. And so lots of different locations. Wherever those lo uh, habitats are located, uh, every organism is going to have to fill a specific niche. And so a niche is exactly how that organism interacts uh, with that habitat. So how, where do they live in that habitat? Uh, where do they get food? Where do they get water? How do they get food? How do they get water? <laughs> typically what we see in ecosystems is that niches uh, typically don't overlap very much. So here we've got the example of uh, these birds that live here more towards the top section of the plant of the tree, sorry. And then this species, which is around this area, and then this species, which is near towards the bottom. And so they might have areas that overlap. Here they're highlighting a section that overlaps. But mostly they have, they have their own area. So this guy will go here, you know, this person, this one will go here, this one will go here. And so it's their own little specific part of this uh, habitat. So you could say this whole thing is, uh, is their habitat, the, uh, the tree. And so they live in a particular niche of that habitat and they maybe get food from that one specific part of the plant, right? And so that's how they interact with their habitat. Uh, a species is a group of organisms of the same uh, popula or population or a group of organisms that are the same type and they are able to reproduce with each other and they can produce offspring that can also reproduce by themselves. So that would be a species. Where population is a group of individuals that are of the same species and they're living in a particular area. So we have populations of human beings in various locations all over the earth. 
And so we can have populations of squirrels in different locations all over a, a large park, like the Windsor Park that's near the, near the school. So it's just a group of organisms that are the same species. And then if we take all the populations that are in an area and we put them together, then we would call that a community. So it's all of the community. The community is all the living uh, populations interacting with each other. So we do not consider the non-living parts whenever we are talking about a community. We're only talking about the living parts or the, uh, the actual um, populations of different species. Now, if we take the community and we think about the abiotic factors, right? So we take all the biotic factors and all the abiotic factors, that's when we circle back up to an ecosystem again. So depending on whether or not we're looking at a very specific thing or something that's more general, uh, there's different appropriate vocabulary. And you need to make sure that you're using the, uh, the correct vocabulary as you, uh, you practice answering questions and things or thinking about this unit. So just to summarize as well, when we talk about abiotic factors, you should know what that word means, but you should also be able to give examples of abiotic factors. So again, these are things that are, are not living, right? But they are part of the environment and they will influence things that are in the environment. So your temperature will influence things, right? Even though temperature is not a living thing. The amount of light, the pH of the water or the pH of the soil, the nutrient levels, that we find in the soil or the water, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide that is present, the amount of oxygen that is present, all right? So these are all these non-living variables in the environment uh, that are influencing the living things but are not actually living themselves. So when we think about all this different all these different ecology, sorry, all these different ecological vocabulary words, we can group them together and stack them in terms of what is we would call certain hierarchies. So the most general hierarchy would be the idea of a biome. So on Earth, we have different biomes, and these are areas that are heavily controlled by the climate, by only abiotic factors, typically the amount of water and the, uh, the weather patterns and temperatures that they experience. So a desert is a biome, a tropical rainforest is a biome, grasslands, uh, temperate forests. So these are all examples of different types of biomes. Then within a biome, we would have a specific ecosystem. And if you remember, an ecosystem is when we look at both the abiotic and the biotic factors at the same time. Then in that ecosystem, we could focus on a community. So we could ignore the abiotic factors and only focus on the living things, the biotic factors, so then that would be a community. Within the community, we could focus on just one specific population, one specific type of, one specific species or group of uh, individuals of that species. And then in a population, in a population, we can focus on a specific organism or individual, okay? So then as we talk about the community, we talk about the living parts of an ecosystem, right? All the different populations. We have to think about what are the roles that all those different populations are, are in, uh, species are playing in that community. And one of the things we are easiest to think about and should be focusing on is energy. How is energy moving through our ecosystem by uh, this, um, these living organisms, right? By these different populations uh, in the ecosystem, right? So energy is super important because without energy, right, we wouldn't be able to have a stable ecosystem. We're all just passing energy from one place to another when we're thinking about the, the flow of energy through an ecosystem. And so there are some specific vocabulary words or specific roles you need to be aware of. So our first one is the idea of a producer. And so a producer are super important because they're the ultimate source of energy uh, in an ecosystem. So the sun is the first source is the where all energy on earth is really coming from and so sunlight comes through the clouds through the atmosphere and it hits the surface of the earth some of that sunlight will get absorbed uh, by our photosynthetic autotrophs and we talk about autotroph we're talking about something that can automatically make its own food so that's what it means to auto and produce food or uh, have food so it automatically makes its own food being photosynthetic means that it will do photosynthesis, right? So these are 
you know, plants. You're probably imagining lots of different plants, but there's also lots of different types of organisms that do that, that are not plants. There are different bacteria that do this as well. There's actually a group of bacteria um, called diatoms, and diatoms make about 43% of the air uh, in Earth's atmosphere. So most of the air that you breathe actually is coming from bacteria that live in uh, fresh water and salt water all over the Earth instead of, you know, plants that are covering the surface of the Earth. Now, there are environments on Earth where we do not have any sunlight. So the very, very deep bottoms of the ocean, uh, there are thermal jets. And these thermal jets, there are chemoautotrophs nearby. And so chemoautotrophs can use inorganic material uh, and they can use energy from the hot thermal vents. So here we've got lots of heat that's coming out of the Earth's crust and it's mixing with the water and making the water have really high temperatures. So it can take inorganic materials, it can take this really high temperatures, and uh, these chemoautotrophs can produce uh, um, carbohydrates and fats and proteins, all those things we learned about from the cells unit, right? Uh, and then so they can be the basis, they are the producers uh, for uh, their ecosystem. So uh, whether or not you're on land, in the uh, upper part of the ocean, or in the very deep part of the ocean, everything is going to have to come from a producer. That is the very beginning part of our ecosystem. Now, once we have got energy into our ecosystem through our producers, through the autotrophs, then we need to pass it around through different types of consumers. So a consumer is something that cannot make its own energy, so we would also call it a heterotroph. So troph, again, referring to uh, energy or nutrition, and hetero meaning that it came from another source or a different place. So they're going to have to consume something, they're going to have to eat something in order to get energy. So uh, a lot of these you've probably heard of before. We have got herbivores, which would be things that only eat plants, Carnivores, which would be things that mostly eat animals, and omnivores, which will eat either plants or animals, depending on um, the situation, or like what's available to them. We also have decomposers. So it's important for energy to be passing from producers to consumers, but ultimately we have to be able to break down energy that gets stuck in dead organic material. So when things die, uh, all the carbon atoms and nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms, all the things that they are made out of, all that sugar and fat and protein, that's all going to be wasted energy uh, that the ecosystem really could be using, but it's too big and complicated or uh, in order to break it down. So if we're really going to get rid of these dead material and make sure that it gets recycled back into our system, we need our decomposers to help take dead material and waste material and break it down again into smaller compounds in order for it to be reused by uh, plants, by the producers, for example. So we've got decomposers, and we can put our decomposers into two different categories. We could talk about them as saprotrophs, and we could talk about them as detrivores. So saprotroph is the idea, again, troph being nutrition and sapro being the idea that it's consuming uh, uh, dead material. And a saprotroph is going to digest dead material uh, outside the body and then absorb it. So this would be things like slugs and bacteria and fungi. So they will release a bunch of chemicals and enzymes that will help to break apart all of the living material, or sorry, well, dead material, the organic material that they're, they're eating. Uh, but they don't really like bite into it. They don't have a mouth. They will just absorb the material into their body as it gets liquefied from this uh, digestive process. So basically they just do digestion outside of their body and then kind of drink the material that, that they have digested. Now the other side of this would be a detrivore. And a detrivore is an organism that is also going to be eating dead material, but it will be digesting it inside its body. So if you think of like an earthworm, for example, or different types of insects. They will digest a whole bunch of dead material, but they actually bite into that material and then they eat, they swallow it and it goes into a digestive system and so it digests inside their own body. Now these are detrivores and saprotrophs. Most of the time we're thinking of really, really small organisms. If we're dealing with a really, really large creature that's already dead, we can still have animals that feed on it. So we can also have animals acting like scavengers. So they will eat an animal that has already been killed, or what we'll say, or what we can call a carcass. 
Now, this means that they didn't kill the animal themselves. They either watched some other animal kill it, uh, and then when that animal was done eating, they came along and they ate whatever the leftovers were. Or maybe they found the dead animal. They just go hunting for any dead animals that happen to be around in the area. Uh, and then they, uh, you know, eat whatever dead animals they find. But they don't really put a lot of energy into trying to kill anything because they'll just wait for uh, uh, their um, for a dead animal to, to just uh, appear or they can go hunting for them. So when we think about energy and nutrition passing from producers to consumers, ultimately ending up in our decomposers because everything dies and has to be recycled back into our system, uh, we can map out the movement of energy and nutrition through an ecosystem using a food chain. And so a food chain basically is a uh, describing the feeding relationship between producers and consumers and is basically a single chain uh, going from producers to ultimately the, our top consumer. So to give you an example, we have a pond, and in that pond we have uh, algae, which would be our, cons our producer. And so there in the pond we also have tiny little shrimp that will eat the algae. So they are herbivores, and they would be considered the first level of consumer, so they are a primary consumer. Then we have small fish that will eat the uh, algae, or sorry, not the uh, algae, they will also, well they can eat the algae as well, but they will eat the, uh, the small shrimp. So they would be a secondary consumer. Then that small, those small fish are eaten by larger fish. And so they would be the next level, the tertiary level of consumer. And then possibly that fish is bought at a restaurant or maybe consumed by another land mammal that lives near the uh, lake, right? And so that could be our quaternary or our even higher level of consuming. And then our food chain ultimately ends with what is going to be our top Consumer. So now we, we no longer have our uh, to worry about where it's going next because nothing is necessarily going to eat the top consumer. Eventually, at some point, that consumer is going to die, right? And so then he ends up inside the Dutrivore. These are all going to die at some point and could end up in our, sorry, our decomposers, right? So we're really just focusing on the movement from producers to consumers, and we don't typically add in the decomposers when we're thinking about a food chain. So when we have our food chain, every step that we go down that food chain, every, every process we go through, uh, that would be making a new trophic level. And a trophic level represents a, the organism's position in a food chain, right? And so it also tells us information about what is the feeding habit and what is the feeding relationship of that organism with the other species that might be in the same system. So the first trophic level is always going to be the producers. The second trophic level then would be the primary consumers, our herbivores that eat the producers. Tertiary level, or the third level, would be the secondary consumers, the ones that eat the primary consumers. The fourth level would be the tertiary consumers, the ones that eat the secondary consumers. And the fifth level would be the quaternary consumers, the ones that eat the tertiary consumers. Now. There could be even another level as well. We could have a pentenary consumer, but typically that is quite difficult to maintain, so um, unless we're dealing with an aquatic environment. So you might want to take this time to think about what is your own food chain, and uh, you should have did this in your notes. You should have mapped out uh, whatever you are eating, um, you know, from time to time. Uh, what would be your trophic level based on your own food chain? So here, just to give you another example of our food chain here, we can have a clover to a vole to a weasel to a fox, right? And so the clover is going to be our producer, it's our plant. The vole is going to be the primary consumer, and again, that means it's going to be a herbivore. The weasel being a secondary consumer would just be considered a carnivore, right? And then the fox being a tertiary consumer would be another carnivore. We could also call it maybe a high carnivore, a top carnivore, an apex predator. So there's a lot of different vocabulary that you could use in order to describe uh, the, the uppermost trophic level. But that's where the food chain will stop once we hit the highest uh, consumer level. So here we have another example uh, where you can practice going through and labeling all of the trophic levels, the specific roles, the way they're gaining nutrition. And just for a reference, when you are dealing with the words primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, 
Uh, if you think you're having a hard time spelling it or you want to save time, you can also use a number and then a little uh, subscript, superscript circle like that, like it kind of looks like a degree symbol. And uh, you can use that to write primary, secondary, and tertiary, and quaternary <laughs> instead. So here we have a leaf, which can be consumed by an aphid, to a ladybird, to a starling, to an eagle. So then we think about going up in uh, levels of our trophic level and from our food chain. We know the leaf would be our producer. We don't actually want to worry about the word primary, but it would be a producer. And therefore, it's also going to be an autotroph, and it represents our first trophic level. So then you should be able to fill out the rest of this information on this table based on if you have a good understanding of trophic levels. So you can pause the video if you want, right, and kind of quiz yourself. All right, so you paused it. Good. So the aphid then would be a primary consumer, and it would be a herbivore because it's eating plant material, and it takes up the, the second trophic level. Ladybird would be a secondary consumer. Being an omnivore, it would probably be eating both uh, aphids and uh, maybe fruits and berries as well. Being a third level, uh, uh, occupy the, the third trophic level. Starling would be a tertiary consumer and be our carnivore and I represent the fourth trophic level. And the eagle would be our quaternary consumer, our top carnivore, and of course would occupy the fifth trophic level. Okay, so if we take lots of food chains and we put them all together in one large system, then we wouldn't be looking at all these different food chains. Uh, we would be then be looking at a food web. And so the food web looks at the feeding relationship between many, many different consumers and producers and an entire ecosystem. And as you can see from this image below, food webs are quite complex compared to a food chain. Again, because we're looking at all possible ways that nutrition and energy can be moving through this ecosystem. So here would be an example. Uh, we took our clover to vole to weasel to fox example, and now we've added in other uh, insects and animals and producers that would be nearby to create more of a complex food web. And we can kind of group them based on whether or not they are a producer or a herbivore or a carnivore or being a top carnivore, right? So, based on a food web, you should be able to determine what happens to the different species as they, uh, as we influence um, one species, what could it possibly do to other species in the food web? So, for example, they give is what happens if the clover population fails. So, if the clovers go down, what's that going to do to the foxes? Well, if the clovers go down, then the voles should go down. If the voles go down, that means the weasels would go down. And if the weasels decrease, that means the fox are going to lose a source of energy. So they would also decrease as well. If the clovers go down, the beetles are also going to go down, which means less spiders, which also means less cat birds, which also means the foxes are even greater affected, right? So you can see that there's kind of this ripple effect is that by affecting one population, there can be a major shift in the entire ecosystem because the food web shows that all these different individuals are connected to each other. So then one of the last two things that we want to talk about as we go through this PPT is when we think about an ecosystem, we think about food chains, we want to think about what happens to our trophic levels in terms of the amount of individuals, the amount of energy, and the biomass of the individuals in those trophic levels. So we have three different things we call ecological pyramids. And so the three ecological pyramids are a pyramid of number, a pyramid of biomass, and a pyramid of energy. And you need to make sure that you can identify different periods based on pyramids based on their units. So here would be an example of a pyramid of numbers. And a pyramid of numbers basically maps out this same idea that we'll see as we go through this section is we use the word pyramid because it ends up looking very, very similar to the idea of a pyramid, where the producers make up the largest point of the pyramid. They are the base that everything is going to be based on, right? And then from there, we have 
our primary consumers, and then our secondary consumers, and then our tertiary consumers. And there's a significant drop in numbers going from 1.5 million grass plants to 200,000 birds that are herbivores to 90,000 or say insects that are herbivores to 90,000 insects that are predatory to a single bird. So we have a huge drop in numbers uh, because as we're gonna get to the other two, basically as we move through our trophic levels, there will be less individuals around because ultimately there is less energy available for um, the next trophic level to, to be built on. So the herbivore insects, uh, they're only really going to be getting energy from the plants. And since there are less herbivore insects, there's also going to have to be less predatory insects because they're mostly getting energy just from the herbivore insects. So if we keep decreasing the number of individuals present, that's going to have a huge effect on the size of each trophic level. So the trophic level has to get smaller as we move up through our pyramid of numbers. Now if we looked at a pyramid of biomass, I know that this doesn't uh, demonstrate it as well, but we would still see something very similar to what we saw earlier, where we have plants at 100 and, 809 being a large part. Here I'll draw a little bit differently. 37 for our snails, 11 for our fishes, and then five for our top fishes, our, our um, uh, tertiary consumer. So again, as we go from producer to primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, there is a decrease in the biomass or the number, uh, the mass of individuals, total mass of individuals in that trophic level. And we would say that in terms of grams per meter squared. So what is the actual mass of bio uh, biological material available at that trophic level and so it's getting smaller and smaller and it makes sense that it's getting smaller and smaller because we're also losing energy and the number of individuals that represent or that are taken up on each trophic level and then our last pyramid is our pyramid of energy and the pyramid of energy again very very similar to what we we're talking about we see a decrease in size as we move from one level to the next. Plants, the amount of energy, here we see it in kilocals per meter squared per year, and it's good that you remember those units, okay? We have 20,000 over 20,000 in terms of the amount of energy from plants, and that drops to just over 30, or just over 3,000, to almost 400, to about 20 uh, in terms of the amount of energy available. And so this decrease in energy, all right, as we move upwards, uh, is going to also be a result of the fact that there are less individuals and there is less biomass. So again, these things are all connected to us, are connected to each other. So as we go through each trophic level, we are expecting all of three of these pyramids to be decreasing and therefore making this what we think of as a pyramid-like shape. So... As we move through a trophic level, all energy is going to, there's always going to be a decrease in energy from one trophic level to the next. Available energy is always going to be decreasing. And it normally decreases by a relatively consistent amount. Here we have a thousand joules, uh, we have a thousand joules present. And then from that thousand joules that is available, only about 10% will continue on to make a hundred joules. From the 100 that's available at the primary consumer, only about 10% will make it to the next level, which would be 10 joules. And if we were to add in another level on top here, we would expect that to go from there to there, it would be one. There would only be one joule left over because we'd have to expect only 10% of that original 10 joules would be available to make it to the next level. And so when this occurs, we're falling as our, basically our rule of 10. So as we drop in the availability, rule of 10%, sorry. As we drop in the availability of energy and biomass at each level, there's gonna be a limited number of organisms that can survive on each level in the food chain. And this is basically why most large animals are going to be relying on being an omnivore. So things like wolves, bears, monkeys, human beings, larger carnivores they do eat meat right meat's important to them but they also have the ability to eat 
uh, plant material as well because if they only eat meat, if they only ate uh, carnivores underneath them, there would be a limited supply of energy available to them and they might not be able to survive. So they have a better chance of surviving and getting enough energy to be alive if they eat both herbivores, as I, if they both eat other animals and they eat plants. So a lot of larger complex organisms will eat both animals and plants. They will be omnivores because that is a more stable way to exist. So then, as we go from uh, producers to primary consumers to secondary consumers, as we move through our trophic levels, we're seeing a reduction in the amount of energy and the amount of matter, which is our biomass. And so this reduction follows a relatively consistent amount. It's not the same every time, but it's a relatively consistent amount of 10%. Okay, we call it the 10% rule. And so then all that 90% of the energy that was in the original level is going to be lost. And it's going to be lost through various sources. First off, a lot of it's going to be used, right? So if, if there's the thousand joules in my producers available in my producer level, the plants, the producers also need to use that energy to survive themselves. So not all the energy is going to make it from the producers to the consumers because some of that energy has to be used to keep the plants alive. Some of it is going to be lost as heat. So we have a body heat and it's pretty easy for us to think about warm blooded things giving off body heat, but everything releases heat to a certain extent. Even plants are going to be releasing small amounts of heat from the chemistry that they are doing. And so as they are doing chemical reactions, and there's a movement of energy inside all of the cells, inside of the cells of all these living things, nothing is going to be 100% efficient. So all of those chemical reactions are also going to be losing a little bit of heat in the process. And so that means we're also losing potential energy. And then finally, some of it will be lost as waste. So not every plant from the producer level is going to be consumed by the primary consumers. Some of those plants will die before anything ever eats them, or they will continue to live and nothing really ever ends up eating them. So if they aren't consumed by the primary consumers, if they're not uh, eaten and, and used to make energy, then that energy is kind of lost as waste because it, it never really moves on to the next level. The same thing happens when those organisms die, okay? If the plants die or the primary consumer dies for some reason and it's not eaten by the next trophic level, then it gets broken down by the decomposers. And when it gets broken by the de down by the decomposers, that energy does help the decomposers stay alive, but ultimately it's wasted in our food chain because it's not moving up to the next trophic level. So all three of these ideas, lost as waste, lost as heat, are being used, those are all reasons for why we have the 10% rule and that 90% of the energy is going to be lost as we go from one trophic level to the next. So then our last thing here, we're looking at species interactions, the idea of parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism, and hopefully you understand the differences between these three terms. And parasitism, the one organism or one species will gain something while another species will lose. Okay, will be have a negative impact. Mutualism is where both species, species one and two, are both are going to get a positive impact. And commensalism, it's a little bit more rare, but it's when one species will benefit and the other species really has no effect. It doesn't uh, have a positive or negative uh, results because of the interactions between that species. And then we went over these in class, but hopefully you are able to easily identify in a situation with whether or not it is going to be a parasite um, mutual or a commensalism. So if you want to practice this again, you can pause the video and kind of read through them and you can pause it again later on, or you can do the ones in your packets just to kind of test yourself and see how well you would do. But as we go through this, we can see in situations where we have something that is benefiting. So here growing on the limb of the tree is a benefit to the moss, but it really doesn't harm the tree in any other way. So then that would be commensalism. Versus here talking about lichens, we see that between the lichens and the, um, what else we have? The fungus that's there as well. 
uh, there's a mutual thing, so they're both gaining some type of benefit from it. Here, with the tobacco plant being a virus, all viruses are going to be parasites. So, if we would see the virus pop up, it must be a parasite. With the remore, it's really getting uh, to move around, it's getting a ride, it's also helping it feed, but it doesn't really do anything to the shark in a negative way, so it's commensalism. Then we talk about the falcon. Uh, the falcon kind of really gains an advantage here, but uh, there really isn't a negative result to the... Um, um, we have the falcon bearers, the, uh, the geese, sorry, the nearby geese uh, from predators. So the geese are really, uh, um, sorry, all right, reading this wrong. <laughs> the geese benefit, sorry, the, the falcon is the one that's not really benefiting at all. It really doesn't, nothing really happens to the falcon, but the geese benefit because of the falcon. So then it's commensalism. Moving on to talk about malaria, a malaria or anything that causes disease is always going to be a parasite because it's benefiting where it's hurting something else. Protozoan in the termite, that's actually mutualism because it helps the termite go through digestion. Fungi living on the tree, the tree is a disease, right? There is a good clue, right? Dutch elm disease. So it's a parasite, so it's harming the trees and benefits from it. And then here are nematodes. Right, and our pinworms there, we're looking at parasites. They're getting into the body and stealing nutrition from, nutrition from something. Uh, that's a very negative effect, uh, and it's getting a positive, so it would be parasitism. Okay, so then going into some other examples, you should be able, again, to be able to explain why. So these are ones that we went over in class as well. And as you look through these, it should be easy to say whether or not it's something that fits as parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism, and then you also need to be able to explain it. So you can go read through these, and if they make sense to you and they kind of match up with what you did in your own packet, then you're in pretty good shape, because you will see something like this showing up on your test. Okay, so hopefully you found this to be a useful revision video, kind of run through all that material that we covered in class again. Uh, hearing it a second time might help some of you, and uh, you can use this uh, to help prepare for, uh, for your test, which was coming up soon.